when we talk about going high, we go high with facts. Mm. We go high with love. Oh, I love that. We go mm-hmm. high by talking about, you know, the things that people actually truly care about and not creating monsters and boogeymen for people to be afraid of. That's the way we go high. We got to address the suburban women problem because it's real. Welcome to the Suburban Women Problem, a podcast from Red, Wine, and Blue. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amanda Weinstein. I'm Jasmine Clark. I'm Rachel Vindman. And this is the Suburban Women Problem. We know from both statistics and personal stories that representation matters. Whether it's people of color, LGBTQ folks, or young women running for office, it's crucial to our democracy that everyone's voice is heard. I got a great example of that this week in my conversation with Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs. At 35, she's the youngest member of the Democratic House leadership, which means she's able to shine a light on issues that might not even occur to older male legislators. I can't wait to share my interview with her. But before we get to that, what have you guys been seeing in the news? Oi. (laughs) Oi is right. (laughs) I feel like we're going to need, I don't know, uh, a couple of weeks to process all the news from last week. And that's just the big news. And the big news takes our focus all the time. And the little stories, you know, I feel like get lost um, and people aren't talking about it. Um, I know that we texted about uh, the teenager in Utah who is under police protection after a member of the state school board at a basketball game questioned this girl's gender. Yeah. And I'm a sports mom and I am really big on, you know, all the sports. I talk about it every now and then. I do my toast to joy to sports every now and then. And it's really, really concerning to me because it's hard enough being in high school without having full blown adults questioning your gender on the internet where a bunch of other adults now are bullying you to the point where you need protection and extra security. Like these kids have it hard enough. I can tell you as the mom of someone who does a sport, like just because someone doesn't fit into your mold of girly girl does not make them not a girl. And when we saw this happen Uh, Last year at the track meet, I don't know if y'all remember that story, Mm -hmm. it happened in Canada and everyone was like, oh, well, that's Canada. Well, now guess what, guys? It went across the border. Now it's here. And this probably happens a whole lot more than we actually know. We just know what's happening because of what's like being shown on social media or being reported. But it's, it's bullying. It's adult bullying. And I honestly and I prayerfully hope that this woman gets sued because this cannot stand and we cannot make this the norm in our society and for a school board member to do this like this is completely inappropriate this she should absolutely resign uh so i think her name is natalie klein she needs to resign when your first go-to when you have an issue is to attack a child you are not prepared and you should not be in any kind of public service especially a school board yeah, exactly it's crazy yeah well we've settled that so, it's- hey, Utah, get with it. <laughs> we're, we're waiting for the resignation soon, Natalie. We will be checking the news all week, hoping to see that. Uh, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. We will check back in if that actually happens. But I know I have even had, you know, when school board uh, elections here got contentious, someone came out and attacked my child. And this is what this extremism, like we think, oh, you know, attacking trans, like that's bad. But, you know, it doesn't affect my family right now, but it will. And it could affect your family because you're letting it be the norm for adults to attack children. Exactly. Adults should never be attacking children. And when you look at, we already know that students are struggling with more stress, all students. So this just adds to the stress. And then if you're a trans student, now you have even more stress, which is why they have higher suicide rates. And meanwhile, we have adults and state governments trying to prevent them from addressing those suicide rates by preventing them from accessing mental health care, by preventing them from getting the haircut that they want, by preventing them from using the name that they want to use. Which harms no one, by the way. (laughs) I know. Like, why does that affect you? What haircut someone gets? 
Uh, but meanwhile, we have a huge study of trans people was just published that found 94% are satisfied with their lives after transitioning. This completely counters the supposed prevalence of detransitioning. It's just rare, if at all. There's more dissatisfaction with boob jobs than there are with transitions. Exactly. It's just like it's the the canard about the litter boxes. I mean, this is just what people want to latch onto, but they have no idea. I mean, they've, they've never, they have no experience at all, but they really like to talk about it as if they do, because Fox News told them. And our listeners really need to arm themselves with these stats and be able to pepper them and be able to say, oh, well, I was listening to a podcast and they mentioned, you know, this study, which we will link in the notes and you can look it up and read it yourself. But it is really important that you don't just let those comments go, that you you push back on it. And I, I want to add, because from the perspective of a person who sits in these chambers where they put forth bills and they try to say that these bills are meant to protect you know, they're, we're trying to protect people from regretting their decision and all of these things. First of all, you cannot legislate regret. Like people's lives are full of regrets and we're, we should not be making laws that try to stop this. But secondly, the, the data bears out that the quote regret that you are so concerned about is quite rare and that the majority of people, the overwhelming majority of people, over 90% of the people actually wanted to do that transition and are very happy with their transition. Why would we deny that many people the ability to be happy? Why would we legislate that away? And that's what's happening across uh, the country. I mean, he, even here in Georgia, we have bills like the quote, women's bill of rights, which does not speak for me as a woman, which goes directly after trans people. And, you know, they, they make it seem as if they're trying to help and we have to be armed with the tools and the information and the data to say, this is not helpful. You are actually harming people by doing the things that you're trying to do. And it's a very like, you don't know for yourself, so let me help you. So there's big yes. in this like <laughs> misogyny and you just can't know. And like, we even know that similar is true for abortion. We know that over 90% of all the abortions that happen, women do not regret them right? Which goes against the story. Totally, and yeah. there again, mm -hmm. a higher percentage, uh, we know this, a much higher percentage of people regret the person that they married <laughs> than the abortion that they had, right? So if we're going after regret, like that's just ridiculous to try and legislate regret away. You're wait, never going to be able to do it. Wait, don't do that because then they might like legislate away the ability to have to regret who you married and, and like not be able to. <laughs> oh no, that wouldn't force yeah. regret. You have to stay. Oh no, but they do want to do that. They want to take away yeah, no, fault divorce, no fault divorce, which is the yeah. opposite. They want to legislate regret where you will sit with your regret from here on out because we're going to force right. you to be married to that husband because again, we know better than you and you'll be better off sitting in your regret until you die. No, I mean, it's true. They want to get rid of I mean, their set. There are states where it has been proposed and it's this whole thing about the nuclear family and the traditional family. But the way if, if the person that lives next to me is married or not married, that has nothing to do with what happens in my home. And, um, you know, I, I want to mention one thing, though, also, while we're kind of talking about this, uh, it's somewhat related. This idea of punching back or not punching back, um, you know, I know Michelle Obama famously said, when they go low, we go high. That was before 2016, when everything kind of like, really went off the tracks, as you might say. But um, it, it's just, I'm of the mindset right now, and I know not everyone is, um, but uh, I want to punch them back twice as hard and three times as much. Because right now, I am fighting like a mom. I am fighting for the survival of my family to stay in this country for our safety, this country that we love, that we want to be in, that is everything to us. And that's what I'm fighting for. And I'm not going to cheat and I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to break any rules, but I will punch back. But I think Michelle said that, like, it doesn't mean you don't punch back. But like, if you think about going low, like even what you just said, Rachel, I know you well enough to know you are not capable of going lower than the GOP. 
you're not capable of it and you wouldn't do it. Right. Right. So the like, if they go low, we're going to go low. You will never be able to out low them. Right. So that strategy could never be a winning strategy. Doesn't mean you don't defend your kid and don't defend your values. Right. But I think we need to go high in the way that we punch. Right. We are supporting kids. We are supporting families. We are supporting what's really uh, going to help families out there. Uh, that's the way I interpret it too. When we talk about going high, we go high with facts. Mm. We go high with love. Oh, I love that. We go mm -hmm. high by, you know, talking about, you know, the things that people actually truly care about and not creating monsters and boogeymen for people to be afraid of. That's the way we go high. They go low when they attack vulnerable communities. They go low when um, they won't feed kids school lunches and actively campaign against feeding children. You know, they go low when they try to call themselves pro baby, but then once a person has a baby, they literally uh, will not support that baby in any way whatsoever and actively do things to um, completely not support that child. Child care, you know, uh, access to food, SNAP benefit, things like that. Then they demonize you if you need those services. So they're low. If we compare their low to our high, our high is just we actually truly support life and we truly support families and we truly support people's ability to make decisions for themselves. So I think we're on the right side of this. I don't think we're doing the opposite of what Michelle said. I think we're actually doing, we're punching. We're just punching high. They hit us in the gut. We're punching them in the face with the facts. Oh, mm -hmm. that's so yeah. oh I love that. I mean, or if you even think about what Trump said about Nikki Haley's husband not being here oh my because gosh. he's deployed, like, that is so low to attack a military member for being deployed. Yeah, that's that. Yeah. Like, we're not them. Like, we're just not. <laughs> no. That being said, we have excellent rep you know, elected representatives who are continue, even though it's hard, even though it's frustrating, they continue to fight so hard and work so hard, even though they don't have, you know, a lot of partners across the aisle but they really continue to try to do the work no matter what. I mean, as Jasmine does, you know, I mean that um, it's, you know, they're still out there working. Not everything is lost. And, you know, in that space, when you keep trying, things can happen and things can move. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Yeah. And they're working on, there's a lot of people out there working on issues that actually affect us right now, that affect our kids right now, that need to be solved for Thank our goodness. kids, for our families. <laughs> So it was really great to get the chance to talk with Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs, who talks exactly about that and what she is trying to do to make a difference for real people. So I think it's a perfect time now. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll have my interview with Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs. We started this week's episode by talking about the girl in Utah who was bullied by a school board member who questioned her gender at a basketball game. And we've been seeing other stories around the country of the overlaps between kids' sports and transphobia. There's a lot of fear and misinformation out there. So this Thursday, February 15th, we're hosting a virtual AMA, that's Ask Me Anything, about the facts and myths around trans sports policies. We'll be joined by Anya Marino from the National Women's Law Center. You can learn more and sign up by clicking the link in the show notes. Today, we're joined by Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs. She's the representative for California's 51st district, and at 35, she's the youngest member of the Democratic House leadership. Representative Jacobs, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited. And I was actually born in San Diego and you represent where I grew up in La Mesa, California, actually. That's awesome. Well, you'll have to come back and visit soon. Love San Diego. Uh, so you worked with Elizabeth Warren on the Child Care for Every Community Act. We are always talking about affordable child care on the show. So I'd love to hear more about your bill and why it's so important. 
Yeah, look, I'm a 35 year old woman. So basically the only thing I talk about with my friends is like who's having a baby, who wants to have a baby, who doesn't want to have a baby, and then how they're going to afford childcare and everything that comes with having a baby. And so, you know, we know this has been an issue for so many families, even before the pandemic and the pandemic made it worse. And so, uh, you know, one of the things I'm really working on is figuring out how we can get high quality, affordable childcare for every family. So this bill, the child Care for Every Community Act would create a federally funded, locally run network of child care where no family pays more than 10% of their income. Most families, it would be capped at $10 a day and uh, the providers would be paid well, the the quality would be high. Uh, And we know this is so, so important because even before the pandemic in San Diego, around 60% of families couldn't find child care that met their needs. We know that you know, child care centers and providers have closed since the pandemic, and we haven't really gotten it back. And we haven't been able to re-up the expanded child tax credit or many of the other things we were able to do in the American Rescue Plan that really helped families. Uh, and so that's why I think this is so, so important that we as a federal government recognize that this is a public good that we should be providing for families. I love that. I'm barely convinced at this point that the only way grandparents get grandbabies is by not telling them how expensive childcare is and how hard it is to find good childcare. And I know that this is important because uh, oftentimes childcare is very expensive. And at the same time, they have very thin margins that just because they are trying to meet the quality standards that they want to meet for our kids. So I'm so excited you're working on this. Uh, So I love that you talk about some of the issues that you and your friends talk about, which I know all of our listeners and all the women out there can relate to. Um, And you actually came to Akron and you joined Amelia Sykes out here in Jasmine Crockett when we had issue one. And I loved what you said about kitchen table issues, which you kind of talked about a little bit already, right? But when... I think as women often we're told what kitchen table issues are by other people, but you talk about kitchen table issues a little bit differently, which you talked about with your friends. So what do kitchen table issues mean to you? Yeah, I I don't really know what kitchen table these other politicians have been sitting at, but at the ones I've been at, we're mostly talking about our families and how we're going to be able to afford all of the things uh, that, you know, go along with having a family like childcare, like reproductive health care like all of those those things that are so important to our lives. And, you know, I even sometimes hear my Democratic colleagues say things like, you know, we need to be really focusing on what people really care about, uh, like infrastructure and health care and not those wedge issues like reproductive rights, as if like reproductive health care isn't my health care. I mean, in my 20s, literally the only doctor I went to was my OBGYN. Um, and I think that's true for a lot of people. And so to me, the idea that this is some separate issue that isn't like core to all of our lives and all of the conversations we're having around the kitchen table, it, I, I really don't know what kitchen tables these people are sitting at. I, I'd like to hear what they're talking about, I guess. I know. Are they like on kitchen tables on like the highway or something? We don't often talk about highway infrastructure plans, but we do often talk about our kids and our health care. So in 2022, you introduce a bill called My Body, My Data Act to keep our data private from period and pregnancy tracker apps. We know that women are being prosecuted for things like miscarriage, which we saw in Ohio with Brittany Watts. So protecting our reproductive data is so important, but it's something that might not have occurred to your older colleagues. Could you tell us about it? Yeah. So like many People and and especially women across the country, when the Dobbs decision happened, I was furious and angry. And I started getting all these text messages from my friends and peers asking if they should delete their period tracking apps. And we know on TikTok and other social media, there was this whole thing about deleting your period tracking apps. And I use a period tracking app myself. And so I started looking into it. And I realized that there is no federal protection for this kind of data. Uh, And uh, that as you're looking at states like Ohio before we were able to get issue one passed um, and other states that are trying to enact these abortion bans, actually, this data is one of the few tools they have to actually be able to prosecute people. And, and we're already seeing them do it. And we're seeing them use private Facebook messages. We're seeing them use location data, right? This is how they're going to prove that you had 
uh, an abortion rather than a miscarriage or that you ordered mifepristone online, um, that data that's not protected at the moment and could be vulnerable. Um, and so what my bill does is it creates a national standard for all reproductive and sexual health data. And it says that companies can only collect and retain what is strictly necessary to provide their service. So for instance, if you're a period tracking app, uh, you can only collect information I give you about my period, not also my location data and all of these other things. They can't sell it, they can't share it, uh, and I can ask for it to be deleted at any time. Uh, and like I said, this is incredibly important. This is like the one tool these states have to enforce abortion bans, one of one of the tools they're using the most. And you know, I first had to explain to many of my colleagues, one, that women track their periods, uh, and two, that they often- didn't know. No, and often we use apps to help us track these periods um, and why this was so important. Uh, and so I'm grateful that I was here and I was able to do that work. And I think it just really goes to show why we need so many more young people and women and people of color and LGBTQ plus people to run for office um, because we have all these different issues and we need, if, you know, if we're not e even understanding these issues, we're certainly not making good policy about them. I love that you're talking about having to explain to colleagues that women sometimes track their periods and they did not realize that. I would like to know more about what it's been like getting your voice heard and respected as a younger woman in Congress. Yeah, well, um, like I'm sure many listeners of this podcast can relate to as a young woman, I think, first of all, we always feel imposter syndrome ourselves. Um, but two, we always have to be extra double prepared to get taken as seriously as our male colleagues. And that was true when I was running for office. And that's certainly been true since I got here. I mean, when I was a candidate, uh, I can't tell you how many people made comments about my hair, my voice. I talk too fast and my voice is too high. It's still true. Sorry, not sorry. Um, <laughs> that's how we talk. <laughs> exactly. Um I even had someone tell me I should uh, do an ad in a bikini so that men would want to vote for me. I didn't I didn't take that piece of advice. And, you know, uh, since I've gotten to Congress, I probably get confused for an intern at least once a week, um, including like I was presiding over the House of Representatives, which like only members of Congress can do, not even like senior staff. And someone on the Internet literally asked what intern was up there. Like, it's crazy. I get confused for an intern and a staffer all the time. Oh. I've, uh, you know, I've often been belittled when I'm making arguments uh, about policy. Like I was having a policy debate with a colleague of mine about our position on something going on uh, in Yemen, of all places. And my colleague called me a silly little girl because mm -hmm. I disagreed with him. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's still definitely the case that, you know, Congress really is a place that was designed by and for old men. Um, and we have a lot of work to do to make it uh, more welcoming and accepting for more kinds of people. I'll give you some examples. Um, I actually got a carpet installed in one of our long hallways because it's really hard to walk on really slippery concrete in mm -hmm. holes. Uh, and they, no one had ever even thought that maybe they should just put a carpet down. Um, I actually am working with a Republican colleague of mine, Anna Paulina Luna, to try and get uh, parental leave for members of Congress who give birth. So right now, there's no way to vote unless you're physically present. Um, but oh. for instance, I represent California. So like, I'm not going to be able to get on a six hour flight twice a week when I've just given birth or, you know, so trying to figure out how to make this place more welcoming and, and it's important because like I said, if we don't understand these issues, if we're not talking about these issues, we're not making good policy on them. You know, I was the first person in the history of Congress to talk about my own period and to talk about my own use of Plan B on the House floor. Now, those are things that are really an important part of a lot of people's lives. And they hadn't ever been talked about because we hadn't really been represented before. And so it's not that we shouldn't look out for old white men. It's just that for a long time, they were the only people whose issues were being taken care of and thought about in Congress. And if we're going to make good policy for everyone, we need to have everyone at the table. Oh, that's so important. I think especially for you know young moms, if we want good policy for our children, we need our voices there and we need to be represented. And when you have policies like no solution for when someone gives birth and how we deal with parental leave and how can their voice still be heard. And it's also silly, like in this day and age, we are 
today, right now, we are speaking over Zoom, and I know it's you. We can talk about things right here over Zoom. We have technology to make it more accommodating for more people. It's at this. It's a choice. It's really a choice, which is which is not shocking. All right. So one thing I would like to ask about Southern California is that you've been in the news lately for some hugely damaging storms. And this is something that we see California, along with a lot of different areas, that is affecting them when we have these extreme weather events. So have you heard your Republican colleagues talking more about climate change? Or is this still a partisan issue, even though it is right in our face, seeing what is happening? Yeah, I I really appreciate you asking. My my district has been impacted by the rains and the flooding that we've had in Southern California. And and I've toured small businesses and homes that have been completely ruined. And we're working really hard to try and get federal assistance um, for those people to to be able to rebuild. Um, and, And the storms are ongoing. And I wish I could tell you that this had changed my Republican colleagues' minds, but we see time and again that they only support disaster assistance when it directly impacts their district and no one else's. And not a single Republican voted for the Inflation Reduction Act, which is the single largest investment in climate change that we've ever made in the history of the federal government. So um, one thing I will say, though, that gives me hope is that even when I talk to young people across the political spectrum, young people seem to understand that climate change is real uh, and that it is something we need to address. And so I'm feeling hopeful for the future. But right now, unfortunately, I have not seen a a change of heart uh, on my Republican colleagues' part. Oh, I have seen the same thing on a lot of issues, actually, that young people are a lot of the very divisive issues like climate change, which maybe shouldn't be divisive. Young people are like, why is this divisive? Let's move on. We have other things to discuss. And I and I agree. I'm also very hopeful uh, when I talk to our young people. So completely agree on that. Um, so I l- have loved all of your work on child care in a lot of different spheres, whether it's all of us he- you know, here in every community or it's in Congress. We need access to better policies. And one thing I know you've also focus on is military families, that there is a big burden put on military families and child care is very important uh, for military families to do their job. So could you talk just a little bit more about the work you've done giving access to child care for our military families? Yeah, look, I think we all know that it's the whole family that serves, not just the military service member. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there's a lot more we need to be doing to make sure that we are actually, uh, you know, having a good quality of life for these families who are sacrificing so much for our national security. So I'm really proud to represent San Diego, which is uh, the largest military community in the country. Uh, And so we see these issues really acutely. Recently, our child care wait list was up to 4,000 families just for military families. It's now down to 2,600, which is still too high. And like we hear about families all the time who can't afford housing, so they're living in their cars, who can't find childcare, who can't find infant care when their paid family leave is up and so, uh, or when their family leave is up. And so they have to choose between actually being able to go back to work and taking care of their kids because they have nowhere else to send these infants. Um, It's really a problem. And it's not just an issue for families. It's not just like a woman's issue, which don't get me started. (laughs) It turns out many children have two parents at home. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, But it's actually a huge issue for our national security and our military Mm -hmm. because every single branch of our military has not been able to meet their recruitment goals. And we know it's a huge issue for retention. And not to mention the fact that when you're thinking about military readiness, knowing that there'll be someone to take care of your kids and your family is a huge part of if you're going to be able to go to work, if you're going to be able to focus on the job at hand. And these are really important jobs we're asking these people to do. And so I've been doing a lot of work, one, to get our military to understand that child care and housing are issues of recruitment and retention and readiness and not just side things that aren't you know important for them to think about. And also that we should be doing more to address these issues. And so I'm really proud uh, that we actually have a bipartisan, uh, a couple of bipartisan bills working on this to get more child care centers built to try and make sure it's easier for families to access child care in their community. Um, I just uh, did a ribbon cutting for a a big new child care facility that we were able to get funded and developed uh, on Miramar, on uh, a marine base Miramar. Uh, which is going to be a a huge change for so many families. 
And one of the things I hear from child care providers is that they're only in San Diego, at least operating at about 68% capacity because they can't hire enough workers. And so even these child care centers were able to get built on base. Um, they're not fully open and they're not able to, to be at full capacity because they can't uh, recruit enough workers. And so I'm also working to make sure that we address that issue and that the military is paying the child care workers uh, that we know we need for our military readiness uh, with the level that, you know, we think is is adequate to the importance of the job they're providing. Oh, one, as an economist, I love that when you talked about a shortage, you talked about we need to pay them more, which is exactly what we suggest in economics. If you see a shortage, it's probably because you need higher wages. So get those wages up. And I also love that you talked about the importance as it relates to readiness and recruitment, right? So this is clearly important to the military, but also important to businesses in general that uh, it's going to be harder to recruit when you don't have access to child care. And also when we think about the performance you do on your job, I did the pandemic with kids at home. It did not go so well when it came to my job. So it is really important for these really hardcore measures of readiness and recruitment and your productivity on the job that they matter for really hardcore measures of our economy. Absolutely. And um, as an economist, you'll probably appreciate, uh, last term I was on uh, the Select Committee on Economic Disparity and Fairness and Growth, and we had a hearing on the labor shortage issues and workforce development. And it was the Republicans witness, the Republican leaning economist who actually said that addressing the child care shortage is the single most important thing we can do to address the labor and workforce issues of our country. Yes. Oh, I'm going to have to look that up. That is amazing. I would 100 percent agree. Like anyone who thinks it worked out well when our kids were at home while we were trying to work, it's like, oh, I don't know what pandemic you went through, but it wasn't the one I went through. Well, not only that, I mean, a lot of my friends have had to choose between childcare and work. Mm -hmm. And most of them, like a lot of my friends are getting pushed out of the workforce because frankly, like they don't make enough money to make it worth it to pay for childcare if they can even find it. And so um, we are seeing women pushed out of the workforce at a huge rate and we, we actually lose like billions of dollars in our economy because parents can't find the care they need. So this is an economic issue. This is not just a women's issue. So let us try and dispel that notion. <laughs> I love that. So I also have uh, friends who have quit their jobs because like at this point, I can't even afford daycare with what they pay me. So when we think about what we're paying women and women's work, this also affects like your ability to work when you can't even cover the cost of daycare with the wages you're making. Absolutely. Yep. Exactly right. All right. So one last question. What is advice you would give to us for how do we bridge generations, right? How do we have those conversations with people of different generations, younger generations, older generations, so that we can start to see, I guess, more eye to eye on things? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I actually think that we're we're already seeing it start to work. You know, I had an 80-year-old man in a, a swing state I was campaigning in tell me that he had never really thought about reproductive rights before, but his daughter had an ectopic pregnancy and he was worried that if the abortion bans that were in place now were in place then, that she would have died. Uh, and so I think having these personal interactions, these personal stories, we know that when things impact people personally, they're more likely to change their views. And I, I think about this a lot with my colleagues. So like there are some times where I have to just go toe to toe with my colleagues and call them out for the terrible things they're saying. But I also try and think about how I can be affected behind the scenes in actually changing their opinions. So um, my youngest sibling is trans uh, and my middle sibling is gender nonconforming. Uh, so we're a real millennial family like that. Um, but my younger brother is a real champ. Uh, I will bring him and have him meet some of my Republican colleagues so they can't say they've never Aww. met a trans person. And like my brother is a ninth grade teacher who wears like Mickey Mouse socks all the time. So I'm like, this goofy guy is who you guys are so afraid of? Really? <laughs> um, and and I really think humanizing it and not, not 
not going into any conversation thinking the worst of people, but trying mm -hmm. to figure out where they're actually coming from and what fear they're reacting to or what, you know, what societal pressure they're reacting to that's making them think or say these things. And a lot of times it's just that they haven't been exposed to it before or they don't know or they think they're going to say the wrong thing. You know, I find it with my Democratic colleagues as well. Like, I spend a lot of time educating around new language, around gender and sexuality, around, you know, how we can talk about these issues in a different way. Uh, and sometimes it really is not bad intention. Uh, it really is just about doing that education. And so I think young people having those conversations with sort of an open mind and an open heart with the older people in their lives is really the way that we're going to see change. Oh, I love that, right? So we can have the conversation and it doesn't have to be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you said it this way. Just like, hey, this is how we say it now. This is how I would prefer. And then also just exposing people to more and realizing it's it makes it very hard to other someone when you met that someone you know, in the halls the day before. I love that. Well, it has been so great talking with you today, but before we let you go, we like to ask some rapid fire questions. Are you ready? All right, let's do it. All right. So we always like to ask about everyone's campaign rally walkout song. Do you have a walkout song? Okay, I think it's a toss up between California Girls by Katy Perry and Good Old Boys Club by Casey Musgrave. Oh, yes. Both very good options. I like that. All right, what's your go-to coffee order? Okay, so I've been trying to cut down on my caffeine intake. So at the moment, it is a half-calf soy latte. Very nice. Who's someone that inspires you? Uh, for me, it's my grandfather. Uh, oh. he, yeah, he uh, is amazing in many ways. But one of the key things he taught me that I always try and keep in mind and stay true to is that you don't have to sacrifice being a good person and being kind and being ethical to be successful, that it is possible to be both and that you don't need to listen to the people who think that you need to choose one or the other. Oh, I love that. I uh, from my grandfather, I learned a lot too. Actually, he's probably where I got the bug for military service. But one thing I learned from him, even just seeing and watching his life, uh, was how much people can change. I don't, but he was of the genders. We didn't even talk about it. We all just were like, oh, this is different. Oh, you've changed. Oh, look at you change and grow without even talking about it. So that has been something that I, I definitely take with me. Yeah. Yeah. Grandparents are the best. They are. I know. And it's a great way. I think it's a great way to kind of bridge generations too. Yeah. All right. Where can listeners go to find out more about your work? Yeah. On all of the various social media sites, uh, my handle is rep Sarah Jacobs. It's all spelled normally, except I have no H in Sarah, which I think is the normal way. Um, <laughs> so rep Sarah Jacobs with no H. Um, and then you can also go to sarahjacobs.house.gov. Oh, my daughter is a Nora, also no H, uh, which is how we think it should be spelled as well. So similar. Yes, we apparently save a year of our lives not having to write the extra H every time we write our name. <gasps> oh, I'm going to tell my daughter that. There you go. Love that. All right. Thank you, Rep Jacobs, for joining us today on the Suburban Women Problem. Thank you so much. This was great. Welcome back, everyone. Amanda, that seems like an exciting interview. Did you leave it feeling heartened? It was really great to talk with her. She is so well-spoken when it comes to talking about a lot of issues that I think are really hard to talk about. And I love the way that she approaches them, thinking about kind of what, what matters for real people, but also how to approach it when people don't agree with you. I love to hear how she brings in her, you know, trans sibling into the office to meet Congress people who don't agree with her so that the next time they think about attacking trans per a trans person, they know they met a real person, right? That is a real person that they are attacking. And it's not some other that they have no idea who they are. They have to put a face to who that is. And I love that approach of really humanizing things that get dehumanized in Congress and just thinking about real people. Yeah. I, I actually love that tactic a lot because um, I do think a lot of times it's easier to hate what you don't know. Um, and, um, you know, it, it. I hear a lot of this about um, people who leave home, leave their hometown 
which is probably very homogenous, and go out, go to college, and for the first time, they're around people of different races and different different cultures, and they find out all the things that they had been told about these, you know, this group of people is completely false. And they're like, wait a minute, like I was always told that, you know, black people are very violent, but you seem actually really nice and you're not violent at all. And, you know, things like that, or black people are stupid, but you're like the smartest person in my class, you know, like things. So I do think it's demystifying when you actually allow people to meet the people that they are, they mm -hmm. only talk about, they've literally never met one. They know yeah. nothing about them. And so I, I, I love that she does that. I do too. And I love that she does that with every issue, even talking about how her male colleagues might not know that women track their periods and they had no idea and how that could be dangerous for women in the fall of Roe and just explaining it in a way that like, here's what you don't know. Let me help educate you. And I thought it was like a very empathetic way in a way that I could see actually can get stuff done. So very heartening to hear. All right. So on that high note, let's uh, go to our toast to joy. And Jasmine, you're up first. What is your toast to joy for the week? Oh, man. I see. I know this is coming every week, but like I wasn't prepared. Um, <laughs> I so I am going to. <laughs> so, because sometimes you're in the news, you're like, everything is terrible. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I'm like, what is happy about right now? No. So I am going to do my toast to joy because I'm first. I'm going to do it to the Usher concert, um, oh. a.k.a. the Super Bowl. Do, do, do. Um, <laughs> Usher did an amazing job. One of the things that I think he did the best job at was uh, bringing some Atlanta to the world, as he said at the end. Um, so it was an all Atlanta crew that produced the show. He brought his high school band from the school that he graduated from. It was just amazing and it was so fun and I was dancing and I'm not gonna say that I was um, upset at all by the removal of the shirt. I mean, the show was great. So I enjoyed the uh, halftime show. Um, I, I kind of sort of watched the game. Apparently Taylor Swift also won <laughs> last night. Um, I went to sleep before the end of the game, but I, I found out later. So shout out to Usher and toast to Taylor Swift, a.k.a. Travis Kelsey, um, <laughs> who's the guy that was playing in the actual game uh, on winning the Super Bowl. Oh, man. This was a very interesting Super Bowl for us. We had all of the younger because we have lots of girls aged like eight to 12 in our little friend group. And oh, man, those girls swamped the couch to watch the football game. All the dads were just standing there like, what <laughs> is going on? It was one of the more interesting Super Bowls. Uh, that's hilarious. I watched the Super Bowl last night um, with my family, my brothers and their um, wives and children and uh, my aunt because they were in town. Um, they left this morning for uh, to go home. They, but they were here for Ellie's Bat Mitzvah, which we celebrated this past weekend. And that's my toast to joy. It was an absolutely incredible weekend. It was everything we could have asked for. I was very tired and stressed, I will admit, but all of it was worth it. And as much as I was tired and worried, it all worked out okay. The the events themselves, I was able to relax and enjoy them and to breathe it all in. And we were just so blessed to have friends and family from all over the country come in to celebrate with us and to celebrate Ellie. And I have to say, her speech was... Basically, like, um, I was expecting her to say announce her presidential run at the end, but she didn't. Um, <laughs> but she talked about having a bat mitzvah celebrating girls is uh, a, a newer type concept. Um, we, we have bar mitzvahs for boys, which is more traditional. And then she talked about, but girls should have the same thing. And girls can do anything boys can do. And then... Y'all, she brought it around to reproductive rights oh. and she said, I have less rights than my mom did and we have to fight for this and we have to be... Oh, Ellie. Yeah, I know. That's what I was like. I'm sorry, is she announcing her presidential run? <laughs> but uh, it was just really wonderful, um, you know, to hear her talk about that. And, you know, and all that aside, the great thing about celebrating these traditions, about celebrating life moments which it's hard and everyone's like, oh, do I really want to travel for a weekend? And I've been there too. But to go and celebrate and decompress and be with friends and just 
celebrate something that is pure joy is just a mood boost. It is refreshing. It is energizing. And we should do that more because we all, you know, are doing important work and we're tired. But um, it was a good reminder of me of the importance of those moments and having so many generations and, you know, just just there celebrating um, a real life event. And, uh, you know, don't don't lose sight of the forest for the trees. Um, you know, like just we, we need to take time to to celebrate and um, and really be part of those moments. So that is my toast to joy, her bot mitzvah, but also a reminder to all of you that um, go ahead and go away for the weekend. Even if it's for only for two days, um, it'll be worth it and you'll make memories and um, it's really great. So Amanda, what about you? What is your toast to joy? Well, first that is awesome. Congrats to Ellie. Thank I you. am so excited for when my kids have bar bat mitzvah and that's super cool. Uh, So my toast to joy is also about my daughter, but specifically her Girl Scout troop. So they had a world friendship carnival this weekend, which each troop picks a country and they learn more about the country. And I let the girls pick. So I realized for Girl Scouts a little, I don't think of myself as super type A, but my friends say that's not true. Um, But I let them pick. They picked Italy and they did a really great job. They made all of the board themselves. They did all of the whatever they wanted to find out about Italy themselves. I actually had my friend Francesco call the girls who's from Italy nice, uh, and talk to the girls about Italy. But they also made the food all themselves. So you go to the carnival and you bring the food and the girls made. So they made caprese skewer. So easy for the girls to make, but they did it all themselves. I never made one caprese skewer. And they also made pizzelles and they mixed everything together. They put it in the pizzel maker. And I was really proud of them that they uh, did it all themselves. And it's, it's fun to see them, you know, take on their own learning that way. So good job, Girl Scouts. I'm super proud of you. All right. Thanks to everyone for joining us today. Don't forget to check out our Substack at swppod.news. And we'll see you again next week on another episode of the Suburban Women Problem. The Suburban Women Problem was created by Red, Wine, and Blue. Our producer and editor is Amy Thorstenson. Our project manager is Lindsay Quist. And our editorial assistant is Abigail Martin. For more information about upcoming events and trainings, or to learn more about Red, Wine, and Blue, follow us on social media or at www.redwine.blue.